You're watching 12 WKRC-TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. New Year's Eve 2000. Remember last year, 24-hour coverage of the new millennium as it rolled across the globe, near panic about the impending doom that would be wrought by Y2K. Although the excitement level is not as great this year, New Year's Eve is the perfect time to reflect a bit on the past and speculate a bit about the future. A few days ago, 12 News reporter Jeff Hirsch looked at the issues facing the city of Cincinnati in 2001. From filling potholes to filling the hole left by Nordstrom's. The Regal Hotel is smack in between what downtown Cincinnati has to deal with in 2001. The Nordstrom's hole on one side, the convention center on the other. Nordstrom's backed out, leaving downtown shoppers and workers asking, what's coming in? Put some stores there that, you know, we could come downtown and see that it's nice, go in and shop. And convention center is too small. Expansion would mean more business for restaurants and hotels. It'd be real helpful to us because we'll have work to do and have jobs to come to every day and not be laid off. Mayor Charlie Lucan says it's important to fill the Nordstrom's hold, but with the right things, don't rush. The site will become parking while a panel of experts investigates options. Convention center expansion is also critical. You know, if we're going to be a big time city, we're going to have to do it. The return on investment is 10 times what a, what a Paul Brown Stadium is. So far, the city has about 180 to 200 million dollars committed for the project, but another 130 to 150 million is needed. County and state involvement are essential. Now, there is good news on the housing front. This old office building and several others as well are being renovated to bring hundreds of new residents downtown. Well, housing is actually a, a passion of mine because I think long term it, it's the key. I mean, in some ways things are going to cycle and, 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 and the city is going to be reborn the same way it was born 200 years ago and that is with people living here. Of course, most people do not live downtown. The mayor says spending will double for neighborhood market rate housing and neighborhood business districts. There's also more money for road repairs. One other big issue down here at City Hall, the switch over to the new stronger mayor form of government and the first ever political race for that office in the fall. The current mayor, who's expected to be the favorite to become the new mayor, says he hopes everybody just puts that issue aside for several months and concentrates on the other issues facing Cincinnati. Jeff Hirsch, 12 News. To explore these and some of the other issues that face the city, I'm joined this morning by Charlie Lucan, the mayor of Cincinnati. Charlie, Happy welcome Year, back Dave. to Newsmaker. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you. Um, of all those things that Jeff talked about in the package, you and Jeff talked about, what is it that you think is the highest priority in your mind? Well, well two things. I think that the housing in and around the city, and it, it, right now the markets tend to be in neighborhoods close to the city and downtown, the Mount Auburns, the East Ends, the Price Hills. When you say the markets, the hot the hot. Yeah, where market. people want to live, Mount yeah. Adams, places like that. Those are real opportunities for us. Meantime, we've got to do a better job of improving our neighborhood housing programs and our neighborhood business districts. That's why I'm happy that in this last budget we passed, we have more money in the budget to do something to improve neighborhood business districts. Well, this is all related to the news, not unexpected, that we're getting from the census about declining, right. exactly. declining population. And the city just has to bring back some of, or, or get more people living in the city, right? And I, I think for next year, and actually the whole decade, the strategy's got to be focused on one word, growth growth in investment, growth in residents, growth in jobs and the economy because the decade of the 90s and the 80s and the 70s have not been particularly kind to cities. And right now we've got to make a stand because things have gotten to a point where the, the urban core has got serious problems and it's got to, it must be reborn. And, and, I, and I think uh, we have some great opportunities. Well, you I'm know, you were in that one of those uh, interview bites, you cited history, the, the city will be regrown. Right. So you opened a door for me. Um, yeah, you're the historian. Yeah, so from, but from a historical point of view, whether, the way the city grew in the late 19th, early 20th century was as people went out of the city, left the city, went to Clifton, went to Westwood, right. they formed their own cities and the, cities, the city annexed them and brought that tax base and those population back in. If right now, if we look at what's happening in other places, whether it's Indianapolis, Nashville, Columbus, Charlotte, and Charlotte most recently in Louisville, just right. in last, uh, right. the last election, right. they've gone to city-county right. form. This has almost been uh, the third rail of local politics. You can't talk about this. 
Is there any way that the city has to be thinking, though, about some sort of collaboration, official collaboration with the county? Well, it, annexation laws in many states, as you know, Dan, are much uh, more liberal than they are in Ohio. Right. So annexation is really yeah, not that's really off the table. No, I and think. you, when you've got people like Dusty Rhodes and Del High and you know Anderson, <laughs> Town, I mean those people have vested interests in their neighborhoods, and God bless them for that. They care about them, they love them, and they don't particularly want to be part of the city of Cincinnati. I think the key, though, and and we're seeing a little bit on the Port Authority as we develop the riverfront, is regional economic cooperation and how we can participate. You know, there is a there is an interest whether you live in Marymount or Delhi in in the success of the urban core. And, and my challenge and the challenge of the city is to make people understand that that it is very important in this city and every city in America that the urban core survives and is healthy. So I think economic development issues are where are where we can collaborate. Transportation issues, OKI, what we do about light rail, what we do about bus transportation, those kinds of issues I think we can make progress on. But the, the issue of annexation, as you know, for a myriad of very good political reasons, will not be on the table this year. Yeah, well, I, I, I know annexation's yeah. off, but, you know, I, I am concerned about the long run because, you know, you say in the neighborhoods we have to invest more in, in uh, business districts and housing, et cetera, et cetera. We, that line has been out there for a long time. Oh, it, it had. Is there anything different about what we're <clears throat> going to do next year or the next 10 years than what we did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? Well, I think two things are different. F first of all, I think there are hot markets in and around, you know, the Price Hills and okay. the East End, and, I, and the, over the Rhines and the Mount Auburns and downtown. So I mean, the, maximize the, those. Yeah, you, you, you can't make create a market. You, if there is a market, though, you can move it along. And so there are there is that market. The second thing, I think the city is doing incrementally a better job in providing basic services to the citizens. We went from 35 lane miles of road improved two years ago to 140. We're doing better incrementally in, in things like uh, uh, removing snow. The school system, I think, incrementally now, is moving in a very positive direction. And so, that's a critical And that's a critical piece of this. The urban core is going to have a tough time. And, but I think under Adamowski, the new board, they have their levy, their tests are up. I think that there is, there is reason to be optimistic. Let's talk about some of these other concrete things. How important and what's the status of the convention center? It's not just a city issue. No. As Jeff mentioned, it's also a county and a regional issue. Well, as you, as you and I just talked about, it's, a, it's economic development on a regional basis. My, my sense is that we have got to figure out a way to expand the convention center because it brings jobs and dollars. And the return on investment, I mean, compare it to what we get for the $450 million in Paul Brown Stadium. I mean, it's not even close. And I'm not just talking about hotels and restaurants. I'm talking about visitors who spend money and add to the tax base. Um, having said that, the challenge of putting together the funds, and, and I am not going to sell the public on a package that says, we can do it for $280 million, then get into it and find out it costs $400. We've been down that road. The real number is probably between $320 and $350. Okay. And we don't have that money now. We need county participation. We need state participation. If we can get that in 2001, I think we'll be closer to getting the job done. Is that pretty high on your list in 2001? Uh, I, you know, I have created this task force. We have, we're, we're looking under every rock to find partners to to do this, I, I, you know, it's it's a hard sell, though. You know, it's yeah. it's not easy because the the guy sitting um, out in his home in Avondale or Price Hill saying, "What's in this for me?" But if you look at what it brings to a community, there's a lot in it. But once again, if you go to Columbus or Indianapolis or almost any place else, you'll see that they've used convention centers to do exactly to, what we're talking about. That's and right. remember, the report that came out just a week or so ago said, in spite of all that. Cincinnati remains the regional cultural attract. People visit from the region where they want to go first is Cincinnati. Now, if we could add to that a convention center, I think it would be terrific. How important was the loss of Nordstrom's, especially in light of the fact that they also, a few days later, canceled, canceled Deerfield uh, Township store? Because if that one had gone through and downtown had not, I think we would have been talking about something different. But in your mind, how important was that? Nordstrom's a very troubled company. And, and I think, and you must have known that. Well, I didn't. When we first approved the deal, we were only seeing the the, the beginnings of it. Uh, it is a very troubled company, and and I think, given the circumstances, uh, at City Hall when it was announced, with possibly the exception of me, I think council members breathed a sigh of relief. 
um, because we are concerned about the, they were concerned about the cost of it and if Nordstrom is in that much trouble what we're going to get so you know the, the merchants downtown who I, I think have had a fairly decent holiday would like to see us just put surface parking in there until we can do the right development and um, I'm not sure exactly what that is but we will convene a panel of local experts and they will look at that site go outside of our city and, and kind of give a uh, soup to nuts look at what should go in that location. Not necessarily on these sorts of brick and mortar issues. Um, what is it as you look at the city, you've been back in the mayor's office for a year now, uh, had a chance to sort of see things from that perspective, that chair. What is it that most worries you right now about Cincinnati? I'm not talking about a specific development necessarily. I'm just, what is it that most worries you? What worries, what worries me most is that people that have moved out of the city 10, 20, 30 years ago have disconnected from the city, the, the urban core. They've, they've moved out of the city for very good reasons, schools, houses, etc. <clears throat> but I, I, I don't want people to lose their connect with the city. If that happens, I was in Detroit for the Motor City Bowl, and I'm sitting next to a woman, and the woman says, I said, you live in Detroit? She said, no. Absolutely not. I live in, and she mentioned some suburb that was on the edge of Detroit, and she was very adamant that she did not live in. People in Cincinnati still, if you're from, you're out of here, you, people say, I live in Cincinnati. Um, if people lose that connect, I think it's going to be difficult. I mean, that's a conceptual thing, Dan, but I think it's vitally important that people remain vested in the uh, future of the urban center. How about intergroup relations? We spent a lot of time at City Hall this past year seeing police conflict with the African American community. We've seen some talk about growing incivility. We've, you've been on the uh, sort of receiving end of some bitter. What about that sort of mood inside the city? And is there anything as council, as mayor, that we should be doing about that? Well, Dan, I spend a lot of time talking to leaders in the human relations field, black and white, and a lot of times do it quietly. Um, and, and I think there's an awful lot of goodwill, and I know we see in the headlines the, the, the people yelling and screaming. We've had some incidents that, that, that uh, you know, are still under investigation, and when those incidents happened, sometimes I feel we kind of take a huge step backward. But overall, overall, I'm hopeful about the state of race relations in the city. I mean, it's not that they're not that we don't need a lot of work, and that there aren't people who feel um, that they don't get a fair shake. Uh, all those things are true, but I think the dialogue that is going on now is much healthier than what I recall in the '80s. Okay, that's interesting because you were in the same position a while back, right. so. It's more having, mature. Having been gone and coming back, you see it as actually healthier. Yeah, I think it's more mature. I think it's healthier. I think it's more positive. Many African Can people really put their issues right on the table they, and be well, talking about the real issues? Or? Uh, well, unfortunately, what people see uh, when they s watch their cable TV in the council meeting right. and they watch the news, when these things happen, is they see some, some real angry yelling and screaming. <clears throat> and um, I, But I think that the dialogue going on between the police department, the community, between City Hall, the community, the African-American community, just the way we are responding to those challenges, I believe, is healthier than the 80s. It's more, it is more mature, and it's more people are approaching one another more as equals than You know, than a year from now, the mayor of Cincinnati will be in a different position. I, as Jeff mentioned, your presumed favorite going into that race, we won't presume anything on, on who, on the person, but from the perspective of where you sit now with the current mayor structure, current structure of government, what difference will it make for whoever is sitting in that seat next year? Uh, will it make a difference? Is this worth it? Is this a big enough change that having a little bit stronger mayor will change some of the dynamics of the issues that we're talking about? It could be, it could be very positive for the city, Dan. And by, I mean, if, you, if, if the mayor, whoever he or she is, 
Leeds is able to make what I call make a deal. I mean, one of the problems now is that the, you have the bureaucracy and then you have city council. But, but I think that what we really need is an effective political leader who can walk into the room and say, this is what the city's going to do and this is where the support is and this is where the money's coming from. Right now, that is pretty much, as you know, vested in the hands of, of the administration. One caution. City council is still the most important cog in the manager, mayor, council form that we're moving into. If those relate, if the council and the mayor and the manager, if that's if that's a bad relationship, I think that, uh, as I say, a, a, a bad people can ruin a good system. And you know, a good a good system is not necessarily the answer. You need a good system, and you need people cooperating and working together. Do you feel like in, over the past year, I am you, very optimistic. You've about been the able to get more cooperation. I, I am extremely optimistic, not only about where council is going, but uh, where the new election will put us. We have vacancies. We have. I'm just looking at right. what I'm seeing. You've had some of the people talked about them on your show. Um, I think that the the new crop, the the young people, the next John Cranley was the, here a couple uh, weeks ago. The next generation from me. Uh, I think it's a tremendously exciting group of, uh, of young people, uh, very intelligent, and almost a throwback to the, the, the quality of people that city council got back in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, the, the quality of these people coming on uh, is almost a throwback, and you and I unfortunately remember that. Oh, <laughs> they're all friends. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, one final question, tough question. Um, you were describing this sort of triangular relationship, mayor, council, manager. Tough decisions still have to come up uh, this time next year about the manager? Yes. Before then? Uh, I, I, I would hope not. Um, you know, I think John Shirey, with a, a better counsel, is performing better. And by the, If you watched his performance during these last budget, I mean, he was right there. On every issue, counsel had a question about. He, he was right there on top of it. Um, and I think he performed well. And, and what happens after the election will depend on that elected mix. Well, Charlie, you're going to be back a lot in 2001 because we got some interesting yes, new do. kinds of races this year. Yes, we do. And have a good new year and look forward to talking to Thanks you. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Stay tuned. A year ago, the region rallied around the deep tones of the Millennium Peace Bell in Newport. This afternoon, the World Peace Bell will once again call people to prayer. Later this afternoon, people of all cultural backgrounds will gather at the Millennium Monument Center to welcome 2001 by praying for peace. Welcome back. Most of the focus a year ago was on the inaugural ringing of the World Peace Bell. In reality, however, the bell is just the centerpiece for programming around world peace and better understanding. I am joined this morning by Cynthia Goodman, the Creative Director and Director of Education for the Millennium Monument Center World Peace Bell. Cynthia, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thank you very much. And Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year uh, to I, you. I, I, I'm, even though you have a big event this afternoon, um, uh, I'm sure you're a little bit more relaxed than a year ago this time coming up on the on the dedication of the bell. A little crazy last year? There, there's no comparison this year to last. First of all, last year we started at 6 a.m. We would have already been there. I couldn't be here. And we had 24 hours. Um, of non-stop activities. <laughs> this year there's one event. But, and let's talk about that event because that's why I asked you to come today. Thank uh, you. What is the event? What's your goal today? Well, let's, let's describe first. What is it? What's going to happen today? Today we're holding the second annual Interface Celebration for World Peace. And last year we were in a tent outside on the grounds. We were worried about cold weather. We were lucky it was a gorgeous day. This year we have cold weather and um, we have moved the ceremony inside. So we will be holding the function at uh, the Syndicate Restaurant has a large ballroom right across the street from the Peace Bell. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's 18 East 5th Street in Newport, Kentucky. And we're going to give all of those details oh, at the end okay. so people will ha be able to see all of that. Uh, this, this ceremony, 
you're gathering together religious leaders from all different backgrounds to come together to do what? What's the goal of the, the total event? Well, we really like to think that this is a moment to both be reflective and celebratory on the eve of the new year. And we've had the most incredible group of interfaith leaders from the greater Cincinnati area who, who are joining with us for a second year. And I think our main goal is both to appreciate our differences and to sense that as different as we are, we have a strikingly similar belief in a supreme being and also a, uh, a fervent wish for peace. You know, one of the things is in there, the ceremony last year, the ceremony at uh, Xavier University this fall, uh, if people haven't had an opportunity to experience the way other traditions pray, celebrate, this is really a great, it's very colorful, it's very inspiring just to be there, right? For me, it's been inspiring, it's been an eye-opener. We've had to, as I say, respect each other's traditions. We have a group uh, from the Native American Indian Council led by uh, Jean Marie Brightfire who will be doing a shawl dance and prayer. And evidently for the Native Americans, when you open your shawl, you send a blessing out to the audience. So that's one of the things people will be witnessing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a wonderful also Hindu choir, uh, a group of Jain children who dance, will be dancing to a song that talks about peace in the Jain religion and they are really back by popular demand. These kids were so cute and so really uh, had, did such a well executed dance last year that um, they're back again. Good. Let me, uh, in the time we have left, let me just talk a little bit about the Peace Bell. Since last year, over this past year, what really has been the role of the Peace Bell, uh, the World Peace Bell, uh, as you have understand? How has it evolved over this past year? I think we've had a number of activities that have focused on the fact that the World Peace Bell is A, there for everyone in the community. Uh, we spent a lot of time developing our educational program. We're about to launch uh, an educator's guide, which is a K through 12 educator's guide, which will come out this spring. And so we really started with kindergarten students, uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers, trying to teach peace and peace education in the school in the hope that it goes from our schools to our homes to our communities. And is that, is your audience Northern Kentucky, Greater Cincinnati, the United States, what do you imagine your audience to be? Well we like to think that we're starting in Greater Cincinnati and uh, we are sending our message out to the country and to the world. Last New Year's uh, we were seen in Australia, Thailand, uh, it, it always astonishes me when I travel that I mention the Peace Bowl and people actually saw it on TV. Just on a very practical level, how often does the peace bell ring? I mean, in the sense of being swung, not just being hammered, but as we learned last year, all the That's details right, about bells. That's right, there's a difference. That's a good question. Daily, it swings and rings, which is what you're talking about, uh, at noon. And um, the reason why I say thanks for asking for on um, December 31st, today, we will be ringing and swinging it at the conclusion of our ceremony. The, uh, at the end of the ceremony inside the syndicate, we will go outside to the peace bell and we will have a benediction there and a ringing and swinging of the bell, and then again at midnight. You know, then last time you were here, uh, very briefly, you talked about the, the goal for the exhibits and the monument itself. Is that still online? Where very much so. So we're hoping, um, you know, in the very near future to begin breaking ground, and we're developing the exhibits, and uh, we're, you know, moving forward with the project. Well, good luck uh, with the total project, and Thank good you. luck uh, with today's ceremony. And let's give Thank some you. details about that. The second annual interface service in celebration of world peace will be held this afternoon from 2.30 to 4 in the Syndicate Ballroom at 18 East 5th Street in Newport, Kentucky. Easy to find, by the way, right across the street from the bell. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning, and thank you for being with us all this past year. Everybody here at Channel 12 wishes you a happy new year, and we leave you this morning with a reminder of the sights, sounds, and the excitement of last New Year's Eve with the Peace Bell.